Okay, great. So you're gonna have to forgive me a little bit because as John said, I manage uh, several historic buildings for the city of Baltimore and the Baltimore Office of Promotion and Art. So I don't wanna tell you that the Cloisters was completed in 1911 and I'm six months into not doing a tour. So bear with me a little bit. We have a lovely cameraman, Greg here, who's helping us out. So you are in the clock tower of the Bromo Seltzer Arts Tower. And when the building was built and completed in 1911, don't be afraid of that noise. That's the elevator. I know sometimes when we're up here, it sounds like uh, firearms, but it is not. It's just an old elevator doing its thing. Um, so we were here in the Bromo Seltzer Tower that was built by Captain Emerson, uh, who invented the Bromo Seltzer itself. And I don't know, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, but I know that my family has used Bromo as a hangover here in the past. It is no more. But as I said, the building was completed in 1911. It has the largest four-sided tower clock in the world. We are larger than Big Ben, if you can believe that. And our restoration took much, much less financial support than the renovations they're doing at Big Ben. Initially, when the tower was built, it was the largest building, tallest building in Baltimore City. It featured a bright blue steel bottle on the top of the building that many people miss and wish it was back. Again, that's our elevator popping. But in 1939, due to structural problems caused by the bottle, they had to remove it. Uh, the removal process was quite interesting because instead of having a construction company go up all 20 floors, they set it afire, which sent many a firefighter in Baltimore City into a frenzy because they had just survived the big grand fire of Baltimore earlier. And you're looking at the clock tower right now. Uh, the clock tower in the 60s, the clock itself was put on a, uh, was put on a motorized system to keep it running. Most recently, we had a company from Maine redo the clock so that it's back to its gravity driven motion which means it does not run on electricity at all. When we go down the stairs, which will be a bumpy, bumpy ride, uh, you will see the pendulum. But this entire system here was redone as well as each one of the poles that goes out to run the clock hands. If you're driving in Baltimore right now, you'll see that the, uh, that the clock is off. We need to service the clock. And so instead of running it poorly, we are waiting for the all uh, the bolters to return. Captain Emerson was a chemist and an inventor and invented the headache remedy, uh, Bromo Seltzer. He was a very wealthy Baltimorean. Uh, most of you may know him from Sangamore Farms as well, which he lived on and also had a farm that supplied a restaurant in his hotel, the Emerson, which we will learn more about when we go down into the museum. Uh, there is some question as to why he is a captain. Some believe he was in the Navy in the war, and some believe he had his own name. So much like most good Baltimore stories, we rely on the good story sometimes more than we do on the truth. So we're going to take a little walk over to look at, so you're gonna, we're gonna be a little bumpy to look at the clock hands so that you have a perspective. So this is the clock face. And when we had the clock redone, we rebuilt all the hands. We do have further restoration in replacing the glass that is in the face of the clock. Many of you know that the numbers on the clock have been replaced with the words Bromo Seltzer. Now I'm going to step in front. I am five nine, so you can see the size of these hands. These are the hands that we took off the clock when we were restoring it. They are wooden and quite heavy. The hands we have now are wood 
something but a much more effective and economical use of modern technology. So we'll take a little last look at the clock tower. And we're going to go down to the museum. This will be a little bit of fun. So if you're not used to roller coaster rides as we go down the stairs, close your eyes for the next two to three minutes. While we are virtually walking down these stairs, this is uh, this is John's with Baltimore Heritage again. Um, it, for those of you who have not personally been up to the top of the clock tower, um, uh, the stairs they're walking down are essentially ship's stairs. Um, and uh, if you can, I'm not even sure how our cameraman is doing that going forward. So uh, kudos to that uh, air, uh, uh, little acrobatic maneuver. So now we're in the room just below the clock tower. And yes, he is remarkable in how he got down those stairs. I myself have to use past ballet form and go down full first position. So this is the pendulum that is the weighted pendulum that runs the clock. In, when the clock is on, it would be swinging back and forth. And if we were off by seconds or minutes, the way they would adjust it is by putting weights on the pendulum as it's swinging to either make it heavier or lighter. The lightest denomination is a copper penny. So currently, because we're off, we're not weighted, but we will should be back up and running and the clock should be running by the first of the year. So we are leaving the clock room and we're gonna do some easier stairs to go down to the museum. And you can see that we have some of the artwork from our artists of the clock tower and its workings. So we're in room one right now of the Broma Seltzer Museum. It features quite a few things about uh, Isaac Emerson, who invented Broma Seltzer Tower, initial bottles, initial uses of Broma Seltzer Tower, uh, Broma Seltzer medicine, if you will. Uh, I will also say to you that uh, Captain Emerson was quite brilliant in his marketing, branding, and messaging about the Bromo Seltzer medicine. Uh, you may remember if you're of my age or my generation, the slogan, if you keep late hours for society's sake, Bromo Seltzer will certainly cure that headache. Uh, he was known for creating all kinds of marketing materials, calendars, notebooks, sheet music, soliciting famous people to market his product, including uh, many sports heroes. We're gonna quickly walk in. So the Bromo bottle, its blue bottle, was quite remarkable. And so, 
Emerson, Captain Emerson had a very difficult time finding companies that would make the blue glass for his original product. So he then determined that I'm going to start my own name company. So, which he did, which is the Maryland Glass Corporation. And you will see that he produced blue glass for many familiar household items. Noxzema, shaving cream, uh, evening in Paris perfume, Vicks Vapo Rub, which is still known for its blue casing, although it's no longer glass, uh, suntan lotions, a variety of tonics and uh, perfumes and shaving creams, and even toothpaste. So Maryland Blue Glass was open for quite some time and it's no longer open, but it was a Maryland corporation. go into the quickly into the Emerson room which is all things specific to Captain Emerson outside of Bromo so uh, not being uh, he the famous Belvedere Hotel he went in to have lunch one day and was turned down for service because he did not have a suit jacket or a sports coat so he decided, I'm not coming back here, and built his own hotel with his own restaurant. And many of the artifacts in here are postcards or uh, letterhead from the Emerson. We have an old telephone that was donated by Marty Azola. One thing I should tell you about the restoration, the entire Bromo restoration in state now has been overseen and managed by Marty and Tony Azola of the Azola Companies. And we are in partnership with Eddie and Sylvia Brown, who assisted with much of the historic funding to restore the building. And if you come and visit us, this is free to come in to the museum room. The curator, Ernie Dimmler, has gone to great lengths. He's even um, uh, uh, solicited the attention or gained the attention of Smithsonian and quite a few other famous museums to curate and uh, estimate the value of their Bromo collections. All right, we're now, we're going to sort of leave this area and head down to see some of our artists' work. Again, we're going down some stairs and Greg will show you some of the artwork. Um, the particular artist that we're looking at right now has a studio in space. His name is Tommy Roberts. That one, I'm sorry, is Matt Fenton. We're heading down to Tommy Roberts because we're gonna go into his studio space. This picture is Tony, uh, Tommy Roberts. Um, Tommy has been selected this year for his artwork to create the poster for the lighting of the monument in December. So look for Tommy. He's quite talented. And look for his poster. We're going to take a quick peek into his studio because he has a working studio. And he's quite remarkable, and a remarkable person as well. And generally on our Saturday open studio tours when the clock tower is open, Tommy is here and will chat with you about his artwork, his style, 
and his life, which is remarkable. All right, we're going to head down to one more, and then we're going to pass it along. You want to go ahead of me? We have a little more of, of Tommy's artwork. And then we now are featuring Janet Little Jeffers, who is a photographer that has had a studio here since we opened the Bromo Tower in 2007. And we'll quickly go into her studio. Um, There you go. Again, another working studio of one of our artists here. Many of our artists participate in Artscape, the Baltimore Book Festival, Light City, uh, open studio tour with the promotion and arts. They also uh, work consistently with multiple city agencies. And now we're going to pass it to Carol. Okay, Carol, I am going to okay. start your video here. Okay, hello. Hi, welcome. I am now in one of the gallery spaces. There's several gallery spaces here in the Bromo to Seltzer Tower. Um, and, no. <laughs> and I um, have a show currently in this space, in the mezzanine space, and it's called Walking Forward, Looking Back. And it is a documentation of a walk I did from Dorchester County, Maryland, to Chester County, Pennsylvania. So I went from my ancestral home in Dorchester County to a contemporary art space, street road artist space in Ch and, um Cochranville, Chester County, Pennsylvania. It's about 170 miles. And they're taking the elevator down and we'll get a brief tour of the brief round of the show. Um, but I encourage you to come in. It is self-guided. I do have a book available that you can pick up and look through the, the photographs and some of the artifacts I have. Um, but it was a pilgrimage, a walk, a walk in meditation, a walk with um, to discussions from my ancestral home in Dorchester County in Golden Hill, where um, I discovered that um, we, that my mother's family were uh, owner, were enslavers. And so I walked from enslavement to freedom to Chester County, the art space. And I believe they're walking in, if I hear my echo. <laughs> so I'm going to leave and move to the other camera. So, quick trip switch. Um, so if we can come over here. This show is a series, excuse my back, of, of photographs um, that start in the family, the family church in right off of Hooper's Island and Church Creek, um, Golden Hill, and goes through to Chester County. Then you'll notice that there's a series of postcards, the upper postcards um, and lower postcards. The lower postcards um, are the cities that, some of the towns that I walk through, the upper postcards are the counties. These postcards are hand-stitched with the counties and the towns that um, on postcards that were written to my great-great-grandfather, my great-grandfather, and my grandfather. And I think this, we'll do a little quick loop around to show you, and then we'll answer some questions.
First of all, thank thank you both um, uh, for uh, uh, the the virtual literal tour. I don't know if those two words can be used in the same uh, sentence right next to each other, but I I definitely felt like I was climbing down those stairs from the clock tower. <laughs> so you have replicated a real tour in many ways, maybe some unintentionally. Um, but thank you seriously. Um, uh, let's start with the first question, which is undoubtedly going to be the toughest question, and Andy, you had talked about Baltimore storytelling. So the first question in the chat box is, what happened to the blue bottle on top of the tower? Oh, okay, that one I can easily answer. So the blue bottle itself, actually the way it was built, in order for them to take it down, it would have cost too much for them to actually remove it, put cranes up and swing stages and the kind of things we put up when we're restoring the building. So they did set it on fire in order to make it lighter to carry it down. What is left of it is in various places, Baltimore history will tell you that it's uh, uh, out in Northern Baltimore County in someone's backyard. The reality is, is that um, it was sort of a mesh chicken wire with a little bit of blue um, steel burned into it. So it's not a full bottle that's left, but people all over Baltimore County will tell you that it's in their backyard. <laughs> well, well, thank it's you. It's not for in this. my backyard. <laughs> not in my backyard. <laughs> And Greg, um, our camera friend and big promo volunteer, says it's not his yard. <laughs> All right. Well, you're 0 for 3. I think it's in my backyard, so I'm going to claim that one. All right. Don't give out an address. All right. So second, uh, second question is for Carol. Um, uh, how long did it take to make the journey? Well, I didn't. I I didn't do it in one fell swoop. So I sort of use the analogy of walking the Appalachian Trail and there's through hikers and section hikers. So I was a section hiker. So I did the 170 miles. Actually, originally it was supposed to be about 130. Um, but as I began walking and people joined me for different sections that had wanted to um, walk a certain section, I did some on my own. But as I started walking, it became such a meditation and walking the landscape that I changed my route and I went across the state of Delaware and up the, along the Delaware River on Route 9 and then got to Wilmington and had to cut across up to Chester County. So it was, um, it was over a course of about three months that I did it. So I was a fair weather hiker um, or walker, I should say. I did walk in some rain and a little bit of snow, but for the most part, it was you know, nice weather. So. Hence the photographs show pretty nice weather, some clouds, but no real heavy rain. Uh, um, a couple more for you uh, real quick was how long is your exhibit open um, and how do you order prints? <laughs> um, I'm going to answer part of that. So right now we because of COVID, the Bravo has been closed to the public. We are scheduling our Saturday opens. And right now, um, Carol's, pro we do not have a, a program after Carol's and anything she had scheduled after is been delayed. So we're going to keep it up as long as Carol will let us. Again, we're anticipating opening back up early December for our Saturday tours and uh, her, ex her exhibition will be up then. She also, I'm gonna say two things, has another one downstairs that's a little different but similar theory, themes. Um, and also we had initially before COVID talked about doing some walks with Carol for various places here in Baltimore 
which we are discussing doing virtually now. So we'll start posting those on our website when we have dates and times. And as far as getting prints, um, I guess you'd be the easiest contact. Yeah, you can reach out to me. Uh, you can arrange that. Uh, on the Bromo website, if you hit contact Annie Applegarth, it'll come to me and I will get the work done. Or you can, if you want to send an email, carol at streetroad.org. There you go. Well, one more question for you, Carol. What camera lens or lenses did you use? Oh, my iPhone. They're all done on the iPhone. <laughs> Because it fits in your pocket. <laughs> yeah. And it was funny because um, photographing, I found that when I was with other people and I was, we were engaged in conversations, I took less photographs. <laughs> and when I was um, by myself, I would, you know, stop and linger. And um, the walks definitely changed by myself. I took mo more photographs on my own and less when I was engaged in conversations. All right, we are at 1.30. We are always, uh, although we don't always hit our mark, we try to hit our half an hour mark. Uh, but if there is a last question out there, uh, type fast. We'll give, uh, I'll give you, a, I'll give you, a, I don't know how fast you can type. Um, if you're like my daughter on her iPhone and you use only your thumbs, you can still type about 90 words a minute, which I'm amazed at. Uh, but all right, we did, uh, some, somebody's as fast as she is. Um, uh, this might be the same uh, photography buffs. Did you use any filters? And there, there are, by the way, I should um, say to Annie and Carol, there are, uh, the thank yous are pouring into the chat box. So uh, the thank Oh, nice, box. thank you. Uh, they're drowning no. out the questions, but I, I think I did no catch filters. one about filters. No. <laughs> but also, you know, we're awful honored to be a part of this program. Thank you to everybody who signed on. Um, we're happy to always work with this group because it's fabulous and fun and wonderful. So hopefully we'll see some of you in person or virtually again soon. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you for inviting. So, don't, don't go, I'm catching two more. And you gotta answer filters. Did you use any filters? No, no filters. No filters, okay. All right, okay, photography buffs. I hope that helps. Email, uh, email Carol. Um, two more questions that I think I caught. Uh, is there any plan to put the bottle or a bottle back up on top again? Well, it's interesting that you're saying that because during uh, uh, Light City, which Baltimore Office of Promotion and also is the sponsor and promoter of, we talked to quite a few um, artists who could possibly project something. How would you project something um, to see how that would work? So we're investigating that. I think we're still sort of struggling through these OLAs have been fantastic in helping us restructure do the structural work on the building, but there are still some very significant concerns about putting something back on the top of the building. Um, a few years back, we did some virtual uh, projections with the Hippodrome Theater when they were doing uh, Phantom of the Opera and they were very popular for people to come see. Well, we'll uh, I think you have 200 people now uh, urging you to do something like that again, Andy. So, <laughs> um, final question uh, from somebody is, is, um, is, is there Bromo uh, memorabilia that uh, people can purchase? And if so, how? Um, there is a little bit of Bromo memorabilia here that Ernie Dimmler, our curator, has uh, but for sale, it's, it's not quite a lot. We have some old postcards that we have. Uh, they're very small bottles that, that we have here for sale. Um, we also, um, uh, you know, I have to tell you, it's more, uh, if you're a, I hate to say it, a junker or somebody that goes to all of the um, flea markets and stuff around Baltimore. Treasure hunter. Treasure hunter, thank you. <laughs> Treasure hunter. Um, you can find them fairly easily. All right, I lied. And then this really is going to be the last question. There's a question about, uh, is the tower related to the tower in Provincetown, Massachusetts? No, it is not. We are actually, oh, I'm going to say this word wrong. Hold on, I'm going to use my cheat sheet because my, my Italian isn't what it once was. Is actually based on uh, the Palazzo Vecchio. Palazzo Vecchio in Italy. 
I never say that word right. It's like my mother used to always say Tylenol instead of Tylenol. <laughs> like there's some words aren't coming out right. Sorry. <laughs> You can blame it on the connection, Andy. That's just fine. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Break it up. <laughs> All right. With with that with that purely Baltimore, totally Baltimore ending, we're gonna uh, we're gonna wrap it up. I'll say thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, if you uh, only caught caught part of it, it is recorded and it will be on the Baltimore Architecture Foundation's YouTube channel. Uh, so you can uh, you can either watch it again or share it with uh, your loved ones this weekend. So have a good one. Um, check out Doors Open Baltimore, and we will see you on another one of our virtual history talks uh, soon. All right, I think uh, I think we're gonna pull the plug.